Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazar, and today the subject we are studying is uh, O levels uh, physics 5054. And today we have set our hearts to solve our MCQ paper. We call it paper one. And today we have selected May June 2022 one two paper. This paper one belongs from the zone two. So let's start today's uh, paper. Okay, so here we go. This is the May June 2022 one two paper. Multiple choice questions are there. So the first question coming up on your screen. He says, uh, a force of three Newton and a force of four Newton act on an object. What is the maximum possible result of these two forces? You see, when the two forces acting on a body, the maximum possible resultant force is when both the forces are parallel to each other and they are aligned, the angle between them is zero. They are acting in the same direction. In that case, the resultant force will be maximum and that will be possible. Uh, you can see there, I have shown here and if the two forces are acting in the same direction along the same line, then their resultant will be um, their arithmetic sum. So that will be three plus four. So the maximum possible resultant force can be, uh, that can be, uh, you know, I mean, seven Newton. So let's check the answer. Question number one, C is the right choice. Okay, so the next question coming up on your screen. Question number two. A length of copper wire is labeled. Length is 0 0.50 uh, meter. And the uh, diameter is 0 0.50 millimeter. Which instruments are most suitable to measure accurately the length and the diameter of the wire? You see this length is half meter. 0 0.5 meter means half meter. It's a copper wire, so you can use a meter rule to measure the length. The diameter of the wire is always measured with the micrometer. So the best thing is the length should be measured with the meter rule and the diameter should be measured with a micrometer. So I think that uh, the answer should be uh, something like uh, B. B, I think, is the right answer. Okay. So question number two, B is the right answer, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says, uh, the graph shows the speed time graph for a parachutist who jumps from a plane but does not open his parachute immediately. At which point does he open his parachute? So here you see when he jumps, his speed is zero and the speed gradually increases, increases, increases. And then he comes to the terminal velocity. But this velocity will be very high speed, uh, the speed becomes constant. Here you can see all of a sudden the speed has started decreasing. So at the point B, he has actually opened his parachute and the air resistance acting on him has, has become more than his weight. And that's why the resultant force is in upward direction. And uh, because when the resultant force is opposite to your direction, uh, it creates deceleration and your speed starts decreasing. So at the point he has opened his, at the point B, he has opened his parachute. So we think that uh, B is the uh, right answer. So I think B is the right answer. So let's check. Question number three, B is the right option, sir. Okay. So now let's go to the next question. The next question on your screen is question number four. He says a uh, 60 kg passenger enters a stationary lift. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. How much force does the floor of the lift exerts on the passenger when he, the lift accelerates upward at uh, two meter per second square? So the acceleration is given, the man is standing in a lift. So here we go. So. In this question, you see there is a man whose weight is acting uh, downward and his mass is 60 kg. So how much will be his weight? And uh, that will be uh, mg, um, 60 kg multiplied 10 Newton per kg. So it will be 600 Newton. 
so the so that's the weight which uh, which is acting uh, downward now the lift is accelerating upward so and it's accelerating with the uh, with the speed of 2 meter with an acceleration of 2 meter per second square so the resultant force must be by the newton's second law of motion we can find the resultant force which created that acceleration and that is equals to f equals to ma so f is equals to 16 into 2 and that will be 120 newton so the total upward force uh, should be this resultant force for acceleration and the lift also has to overcome the weight of the man so the upward force with uh, the the lift has to apply that is uh, the force for the acceleration that is 120 newton and it also has to overcome the weight of the man and that is 600 newton so the total force the lift has to apply on the man is 720 newton 720 newton 720 newton i think uh, 720 newton and this answer is i think it is i think d is the right choice sir so let's check question number four d is the right choice okay so here we go Okay, so then we have the question number five, and the diagram represents the moon in its orbit around the Earth. Which arrow represents the direction of the resultant force acting on the moon at the instant shown? You see, whenever you move in a circle track, the resultant force is always towards the center of the circle. So I think uh, A is the right choice. The resultant force is always towards the center of the circle. So I think A is the right choice. Question number five, I think A is the choice. Yes, sir. Question number five, A is the right choice. So, okay. So uh, the next question is showing up on your screen. And he says, uh, a measuring cylinder containing water is placed on a balance. A stone is placed into the water. The diagram shows the readings on the balance and on the measuring cylinder. What is the density of the stone? You see, uh, the volume of the water is 20, and now the volume of the water when you have put the stone into the water is 35. So from 35, subtract 20, and you will get uh, 15 centimeter cube. That's the volume of the stone. Now. Here you see the mass is 55.0 gram. And when you have put the stone in, uh, the mass is 92.5 gram. So from 92.5 minus 55, you will get the mass of the stone. Once you know the mass of the stone and the volume of the stone, divide the mass of the stone with the volume of the stone, and that will give you the density of the stone. The method is very simple. Okay, so here we go. M1 is 55 gram, M2 is 92.5 gram. So the mass of the stone will be M2 minus M1. That will be 92.5 minus 55. And that will be uh, 37.5 gram. Volume 1 is 20 centimeter cube. The volume 2 is 35 centimeter cube. The volume of the stone will be V2 minus V1. And that will be 35 minus 20. And that will be 15 centimeter cube. Now, the density of the stone will be mass divided by volume. The mass of the stone is 37.5 gram, and the volume of the stone is 15 centimeter cube. So the density will be 2.5 grams per centimeter cube. So this is how you will find the density of that stone. So 2.5 grams per centimeter cube. 2.5 grams per centimeter cube. So I think that the... Uh, So I think C is the right choice. Uh, it looks that C is the right choice. Question number six, C looks the right choice. Yes, sir, C is the right choice. Okay, so we are going to the next question. And the next question coming up on your uh, screen is question number seven. He says, the diagram shows a uniform solid rectangular block of weight 50 Newton. That is pivoted about the point P. The height of the block is 40 centimeter. The base of the block is eight centimeter wide. The which horizontal force F just take makes the block start to 
rotate about the P. Okay, so try to understand about this uh, corner, about this vertex, and about the, this point, the block will rotate and this force will try to rotate it. So this is the pivot. So here is the center of the gravity of that block and its weight is acting along this line. So the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the weight and this pivot will be half of the eight centimeter and that will be four centimeter. And this weight is trying to produce a anti-clockwise turning effect. This force, which is acting here, and this is the line of action of that force, this is trying to produce a clockwise turning effect about this point P. And the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the F and the pivot here is 40 centimeters. So I can apply the law of uh, the, the principle of moments. And that says that the clockwise moment will be equal to the anti-clockwise moment. And let me show you. <clears throat> so here we go. So W multiplied D1 will be equals to F2 multiplied D2. The weight is 50 Newton and the is, is perpendicular distance from the pivot is 40 centimeter. And F2 is supposed is F. We want to find out. And D2 is 40 centimeters. So the F will be 50 multiplied 4 divided by 40. So F will be 5 Newton. So the force needed is at least 5, more than 5 Newton actually. So I think B looks the best option. At this force, uh, the body will be, the body will be, uh, you know, in the equilibrium. So the force, to, uh, what is my answer? Uh, five Newton, I think B is the answer. That's question number seven. Question number seven, B is the right answer. The center of mass of a solid rectangular block is at, at its center. A small heavy weight is available. In which our arrangement is the center of the mass the lowest? Okay. So I think uh, that um, this phase Y, this one, this is phase Y, and this phase is X. Okay. So I want the center of the mass to be lowest. So I will, I will. It should be on the face Y. The face Y should be touching the table. And because this area looks the largest. And then this height will be the smallest height. And the with the face X on the table now, that's not wrong. But then because the height of that, in that case, the height will be very, uh, I mean, it will be higher. So the center of the mass will become higher if the face X is downward. If the with the face Y on a table, yes, that is true. With the face X on the on a table and the heavy weight attached centrally on the top of the block, that is wrong. The face X should not be down. Face uh, with the face Y on the table and the heavy weight attached centrally on top of the block. Yeah, that can be. That can be. So I think D looks the best option, sir, because we also have to put that mass there. So I think D is the right option. Question number, uh, sorry. But there's a problem. If you put, uh, uh, you know, a mass with it, the center of mass of a solid rectangle block is at its center. A small heavy weight is available. In which argument is the center of the mass lowest? With the face X on a table? No, because if you put uh, uh, the face x downward then the because this this length will be then becomes height so the center of the mass will be higher with the face y on a table yes that is true that is 100 percent true so i think this is the best option uh, not the d1 okay now you see uh, the B is the right answer, not the D. Because in the D, you see what you have done, you have put a heavy weight also, and that weight is in the on the top. So 
so you have added weight at a certain a more height. So the center of the mass will go a little higher. So I think B, B is the best option, sir. B is the best option. B looks the best option. And okay. So B is the best option. Question number eight, B is the right option. Okay, I, I, I got confused with this one, but then I realized that if you put a mass on the top, so that due to that mass on the top, the center of the mass will go a little up. Okay. Okay, so the question number nine, the graph shows how the extension of a spring depends on the force applied, which point is the limit of proportionality. The limit of proportionality is that point up to which on the extension load graph, and the graph is a straight line, means that extension and load are directly proportional to each other. So I think up to point C, <clears throat> they look, uh, the line looks straight, which means for extension and load, they are directly proportional to each other. After that, the graph has become a curve. So C is the limit of proportionality. Question number nine, C is the right answer, sir. Okay, so here we go. An elastic spring has an unstretched length of 30 centimeters. So L naught is 30 centimeter. A load of six Newton is hung from the spring and the length of the spring is now 66 centimeters. So from here, I can find the extension. So when you hung, uh, when you hung, uh, <clears throat> when you hung a load of 6 Newton, the length L has become 66 centimeter. So the extension is 66 L minus L naught, that's 66 minus 30, so 33 centimeter extension. So the load 6 Newton is removed and the spring returns to its original length. A load of 2 Newton is now hung from the spring. What is the new length of the spring? Okay, so and now the load is 2 Newton. I will first of all find how much is the extension. And once I know the extension, then I can find the length at that load. That will be L equals to L naught plus the extension. Let me show you. Okay, so <clears throat> when uh, unstretched length is 30 centimeter, when the load is 6 Newton, the length has become 66 centimeter. The extension is L1 minus L naught, and that is 66 minus 30. That will be 36 centimeter. Now the question is what will be the length when the load is two Newton? I will use this proportion method. Load and extension, when the load is six Newton, the extension is 36 centimeter. And when the load is uh, two Newton, the extension will be X. So I will write six by two equals to 36 by X, cross multiply six X is equals to, sorry, six X is equals to, you know, uh, 30, 72. So x will be equal to 72 divided by 6, and that will be 12 centimeters. So the extension will be 12 centimeters. Now the length at the load of 2 Newton will be L naught plus the extension. That will be 30 centimeters plus 12, and that will be 42 centimeters. 42 centimeters. 42 centimeters, that answer we have is uh, 72, 42 centimeters. C is the choice, question number 10. Oh, yeah, question number 10, C is the right choice, sir. <clears throat> a barometer, he says, a barometer is an instrument used to measure atmospheric pressure. In one type of barometer, the height of a liquid in a tube is measured. In which diagram does the height H represent the atmospheric pressure? You see, a barometer is simply a, a, a tube which is closed at one end, and we fill it with it's a one meter long uh, tube. We fill it with the uh, with the mercury, and then we we take a tray which is also full of uh, mercury. And what we do, we uh, what we do, we we upside down the tube. Its open end is downward, and its closed end is upward. And then we put it in the tray. So the level of the mercury in the tube falls down. 
and that stops at a certain height. Then the height from the, <clears throat> the level of the mercury in the tray to the level of the mercury in the tube, that gives you, uh, that height gives you an indication of the atmospheric pressure. So that height is measured to, to measure the atmospheric pressure. So from the level of the mercury in the tray to the level of the mercury in the tube, and the closed side of the tube is in upward direction. And in the tube, obviously, when the mercury goes down and in that the gap in the, tube, in the closed end, the level of the mercury, there is a, some empty space here. And here you have vacuum, nothing else. Okay. So I think uh, D, do you see these two are the correct figures for the barometer. Uh, but here he has shown in this empty space, you will have air. He has shown here in that empty space, space you will have vacuum. And I think it will be vacuum. Uh, let's check, let's check D choice. So our uh, 11, 11 D is the right option, sir. So D is the right option. So let me show you. These two diagrams are totally wrong. The open end is not upward. This is a manometer, not a barometer. These two diagrams, yes, they show barometer, but the problem is here we don't have air. So this is right diagram. And from the level of the mercury in the tray to the level of the mercury in the tube, that gives you the atmospheric pressure. So this is how you do this. So D is the right choice. Okay, so <clears throat> a manometer contains mercury of density 1400 kg per meter cube. The manometer is connected to a gas supply and the difference in the height of the mercury level is 72 millimeter. The atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascal. And he says the gravitational uh, field strength uh, G is 10 Newton per kg. What is, their question is, what is the pressure of the gas supply? You see the pressure of this gas is 72 uh, millimeter of the mercury more than the atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is already given that is 100 kilopascal. And this 72 millimeter, um, that can also be converted into uh, pascal. So let me show you. Okay, the pressure of the gas, the pressure of the gas is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere plus 72, the pressure of the 72 millimeter of the mercury. So the pressure of the 72 millimeter of the mercury can be found by the formula rho GH. Rho GH, where rho means the density of the mercury, G means the gravitational uh, field strength, and H means the height of the mercury column. And that height, which is given in millimeters, I will convert that into the meters. So for that purpose, you see, I have done here 72 divided by 1,000. The 10 is the value of the G. And the density of the mercury is 14,000. So the pressure of the atmosphere is 100,000. Uh, it's 100 kilopascal, which means uh, 100,000 pascal. So uh, we will write these values here. So this is 100,000 plus when you do it this on the, on the calculator, when you enter this in your calculator, you get 10080. So when you add them, you get uh, 110080 Pascal. And you divide it with 1,000, you get 110 kilopascal. 110 kilopascal. That's number two. So I think... Uh, C is the right option. So your question is coming up. So I think C is the right option, sir. C, question number 12, C is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next question. And the next question is, he says, which device provides a continuous steady energy output for the longest time? A nuclear reactor, obviously nuclear reactor is very reliable and its output is for very long time. A solar panel, no. So you see the solar panel cannot work in the evening. A 1.5 volt cell, you know, you have to change the cells 
of your remote controls of your walk wall clocks so that do not give the output for a very long time a wind generator wind generator is has a problem that it depends upon the wind and wind depends upon the season and the and the conditions of that uh, location so the most reliable uh, method of the energy which can provide you the output energy for a very long time is a nuclear reactor so i think a is the best option a looks the best option to me sir so let's check uh, question number 13a is the right option yes 13a is the right option okay so we Okay, so here we go. He says, a load is pulled by a rope attached to a motor. The resultant force exerted by the rope on the load is shown in the diagrams. In each diagram, the load moves in the direction of the force shown and takes 10 seconds to travel one meter. In which diagram does the motor work with the greatest power? Okay, so first of all, I know the force applied. I know the distance moved in the direction of the force. And I know how much time it takes to do that, to move that thing uh, one meter along the direction of the force. So I can calculate very easily the work done. The work done is force multiply the distance moved in the direction of the force. And then I can calculate the power. The power is the work done divided by the time taken. So time taken is 10 seconds. So I will calculate the work done in all the four cases. You can see the four cases are showing up. And in each, in, in, in each case, the body moved one meter in 10 seconds. Okay, so we will calculate how much is the work done. And here we go. You see the power will be equal to the force multiplied distance, which is work done divided by time. So in the A option, it will be 12 multiplied 1 divided by 10. That will be 1.2 watt. In the B option, it will be 8 multiplied 1 divided by 10. That will be 0 0.8 watt. In the C option, it will be 10 multiplied 1 divided by 10 equals to 1 watt. And in the D option, it will be 4 multiplied 1 multi divided by 10 equals to 0 0.4 watt. So the greatest work done is here in the A part. I think A part. In which diagram that does uh, does the motor work with the greatest power? Okay, so I think A in the A part the. Okay, so now you can see the whole question. <clears throat> A is the right option to me. It's question number fourteen. A is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next question, and the next question coming up on your screen is question number fifteen. The electric energy supplied to a kettle is 600 kilojoules. Of this energy, 45 kilojoule is transferred to the surroundings and 15 kilojoule is used to heat the casing of the kettle. The remaining energy used to heat the water. What is the efficiency of the kettle? You see the total input energy is 600 kilojoules. The wasted energies are 45 kilojoule and 15 kilojoule. The remaining energy is actually used to heat the water. So the useful energy will be 600 kilojoules minus 45 kilojoules minus 15 kilojoules. The efficiency is useful output energy divided by the total input energy multiplied 100. So let me show you. Okay. So the input, the input energy is 600 kilojoules. The wasted energy is 45 kilojoules per 15 kilojoules. That will be 60 kilojoules. So the useful output energy will be 600 minus the wasted energy. That will be 60. And when you subtract the 600 minus 60, uh, the thing is 540 kilojoules. So the useful energy is 540 kilojoules. The efficiency is useful output energy divided by the input energy. So it will be 540 divided by 600, and that will be 0 0.9. So 0 0.9 is the efficiency. 0 0.9 is the efficiency. So I think question number 15, B is the right option. Question number 15, B is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says, how is the heat energy transferred through the vacuum of space from the sun to the moon's surface? Conduction, or in the conduction cannot take place in the space convection. 
convection also cannot take place. Conduction convection both require medium. Then he says the radiation only. Yes, the radiation. By the radiation, the heat can travel. Uh, energy can travel uh, in the space. And the D choice is conduction, convection, radiation. No. So I think C is the best option here. I think C is the best option. <clears throat> Let's check. C is the right option, sir. He says a metal cube contains boiling water. Each vertical face of the cube is painted a different color or has a different texture. Identical thermometers are held at equal distance from each vertical face. Near which face does a thermometer reading read the greatest temperature? You see uh, that face which will have dark and uh, dull paint on it because the dark and the dull uh, paint uh, surface is the best emitter of the infrared radiation. So from that face, the most of the infrared is given out. Uh, so that on the, th the thermometer, which is on that side, that will show the highest temperature, the greatest temperature. So dull black, yes, that's true. And dull white, no, shiny black, no, shiny white, no, no, no. Because the dull black is the best, is the best uh, emitter of the infrared radiation. <clears throat> So I think A, A is the right option. So question 17, A is the right option. Okay. So now we have the question number 18, a liquid uh, column. Question number 17, A is the right option. A liquid column in a liquid in glass thermometer is 2 cm long at 0 degree centigrade. The column expands by 10 cm when heated to 100 degree centigrade. Uh, measuring the from P, how long is the liquid column at 30 degree centigrade? When the temperature is 0, the length is 2 cm. When the temperature is 100 degree centigrade, the length is 12 cm. And when the temperature is 30 degree centigrade, how much is the temperature? That is the question. Okay. So... So here we have how this is done. Okay. So uh, when the length, when the temperature is zero, the length of the mercury is two centimeter from the P. When the temperature is hundred, the length of the mercury is twelve centimeter. When the temperature is thirty, how much is the length? The formula is L thirty minus L naught divided by L hundred minus L naught equals to theta minus zero divided by hundred minus zero. So theta is 30 degree and I want to find out the length at the 30. So it will be L30 minus 2 divided by 12 minus 2 equals to 30 by 100. So it will be, uh, it will be, uh, you know, L minus 2 divided by 10 equals to 3 by 10. Cross multiply L30 will be equals to, uh, you know, 3 plus 2 and equals to 5 centimeter here. That 10 and 10 has been canceled. So when you cancel them, so you are left with L30 minus 2 equals to 3. So that minus 2 will go on the other side. It will add there. So L30 will be equal to 3 plus 2. And that will be 5 centimeters. So 5 centimeters. 5 centimeters. So we think that uh, uh, C is the right option. Question number 18. Uh, C is the right option, sir. Okay. So here we have the next question coming up on your screen. He says, a liquid in glass thermometer consists of a bulb containing a liquid with, which expands into a thin capillary tube. The liquid in the thermometer is replaced by the same volume of a different liquid that expands more for the same temperature rise. The length of the capillary tube remains the same. How does the new thermometer compare with the old thermometer? You see, now you have put a liquid which expands more. So at a smaller rise of temperature, at a less rise of temperature, because that liquid expands more, that liquid will reach the end of this thermometer because it expands more. So for a, for a smaller rise in temperature, the, the, the liquid, because it expands more, will reach the end of the thermometer. 
So by, by doing this, what will happen? The thermometer will become more sensitive, but its range will decrease. It has a greater sensitivity, but a smaller range. I think B is the best option. <clears throat> B, 19, uh, question number B is the right option. Okay, he says, uh, he says that the steam at 110 degrees centigrade condenses on the surface to form water droplets at 100 degrees centigrade. So what happens after the steam, steam comes into the contact with the surface? The molecules slow down and absorb energy from the surrounding. No, they have to give out energy because they are at a higher temperature than the surrounding. So they have to lose energy to to so that temperature drops and that uh, steam converts into the liquid. The molecules slow down and emit energy to the surrounding. That is true. The molecule stays at the same speed and absorb energy from the surrounding. No. The molecule stays at the same speed and emits energy to the surrounding. No. First of all, their temperature has to decrease from 110 to 100. And so when this happens, their kinetic energy will de decrease. Their speed will decrease. So I think the molecules slow down and emits energy to the surrounding. To me, B looks the best option. Let's check. B, question number 20 is the B answer. Yes, sir. Question number 20, B is the right answer. So B is the right answer. Uh, question number 21, which list shows the states of matter in order of expansion from smallest to greatest from the same temperature rise? You see, the largest, uh, the smallest expansion happens in the solid and then the liquid and the gas expands the most. So the least expansion will happen in the solid, then in the liquid and then in the gas. So uh, I think uh, question number 21D is the right option. Question number 21D is the right option. Sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says uh, the next question coming up on your screen. Which road describes the boiling and the evaporation of a liquid boiling bubbles from bubbles form throughout the liquid only occurs at one temperature for evaporation do not uh, happen at one temperature. Bubbles form throughout the liquid, that is true. Produces cooling, that is true. Evaporation causes cooling. B is the answer, sir, but C says occurs at any temperature. No, boiling only occurs at this boiling point. And so the both C and D are wrong because they say occurs at any temperature. The boiling happens on a specific temperature. So we think that uh, B is the right option for question number 22. Question number 22B is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is question number 23. He says, a hair dryer is used to blow air across the surface of water in a beaker so that the water evaporates. What increases the rate of evaporation of water? How you can increase the rate of evaporation um, by increasing the surface area, by blowing the dryer at a higher speed, means the speed of the wind should increase and or the temperature of the dryer should rise so that they can, these things can increase the rate of evaporation of the water. So they say decreasing the speed of the air from the head dryer, that's wrong. Decreasing the mass of the water in the beaker on mass, it does not depend. Increasing the surface area of the water by using a wider beaker, that is true. If you increase the surface area, the rate of evaporation will increase. And D is increasing the volume of the water in the beaker on volume. The rate of evaporation does not depend. So I think I, I think that uh, C is the best option. Question number 23C is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next question. This is the diagram. The diagram shows a ray PQ reflected by the mirror X at a parallel mirror at the parallel mirror Y. Okay, so the reflected ray along the RS, so the reflected ray along the RS is parallel to the PQ, which, so the light came here, from here it is reflected, then from this mirror it is reflected, and their question is, what are their questions? They are saying that uh, uh, the angle between the PQ and the QR, 
is 45. That is not true. This angle here is 90 degree. The angle between the QR and the RS is 180 degree. That is not true. That angle here is approximately 90 degree. And the angle of incidence of the QPQ on the mirror is 60 degrees. That is also uh, not true. If I draw a normal here, this angle and this angle, they will be equal. This is 45, this will be 45, so it will be 90. So this angle will be 180 minus 90, and that this whole angle will be 90. When you draw normal here, this angle of incidence will be of 45. The angle of reflection will be also of 45. So the angle of incidence at the P, uh, you know, at the P, uh, uh, the angle of incidence of the PQ on the mirror X is 60 degrees. That is not true. The angle of incidence of the QR on the mirror Y is 45. That is 100%. So if you draw a normal here, so, uh, so you see if I increase, I prolong this, this is 45, this is 90. And so here you will have 45. But actual thing is that when you draw a normal here, uh, this angle is 90, this angle will be also, this is 45, this will be also 45. This will be also 45, this uh, total angle is 90. So when you draw a normal here, so that 90 will be divided to equal parts. So the angle of, uh, angle of incidence here, that will be of 45. So you see the angle of incidence of the QR on the mirror Y is 45. I think D, D is the right uh, option. And I think the D is the right, right option. So let's check. This is question number 24. 24, D is the right option. It's a little tricky question. Requires a lot of skill and background. Okay. So D is the right option, sir. Okay, so now question number 25. An object is viewed through a thin uh, converging uh, through a thin converging uh, lens. The diagram shows the pass of the two rays from the top of the object to an eye. So this is a converging lens, convex lens. This is an object. So this ray passes through the optical center, goes undeviated. This ray is uh, entered like this into the converging lens. And after this, it has become parallel to the principal axis. So on this side, these two lines, they will never intersect. You can see they are kind of diverging. So obviously on this side, they will not uh, intersect each other. So what I will do, I will prolong them behind the lens and they intersect here. So now the image formed will be here where they intersect it, uh, with each other. And this image will be a virtual image. This um, image will be larger than the object, and this image is upright. So the image formed by this lens of this object is virtual, it's upright, and it is enlarged, it's larger. So how, how does the image compare with the object? It is larger and inverted. Inverted is wrong. The, it is larger and upright. Yes, this sentence is perfect. It is a small, it is smaller and inverted. No, it is smaller and upright. No, it is larger. The image formed here is here. Okay. Where these two lines intersected each other. So I think question number 25B is the right option. Question number 25B is the right option, sir. Okay, then question number 26 is showing up on your screen. He says violet and indigo lights have the shortest wavelengths in the spectrum of the visible light. Which three colors in order of increasing uh, wavelength immediately follow indigo? Okay, so uh, I can write uh, increasing order of the wavelength. We have to write them. So I can I can show you. I have done this question number 26. So it is Roy, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. As you go down, uh, the, uh, the wavelength will decrease. Okay, so if you write them the, uh, uh, the, the, the the colors who have wavelength more than the indigo, they are blue, green, and yellow. The wavelength is more than the indigo, these are blue, green, and yellow. Blue, green, and yellow. Blue, blue green, and yellow. Blue, green, and yellow. Okay, blue, green, and yellow. Okay, so what was the question? 
which three colors in order of increasing wavelength immediately follow uh, indigo so we have to give those colors whose wavelength is more than the indigo okay so the colors whose wavelength is more than the indigo they are blue green and yellow so b looks the right option sir question number 26 b is the right option okay so here we go. A sound wave, uh, he says, a sound wave passes through a substance. The diagram shows the position of the molecules of the substance at one point in time. So which type of wave is the sound wave and what is at that? You know, the sound waves, they are longitudinal waves. And at this point, as you can see, the molecules of the medium, they are very close to each other as compared to this portion. So this portion is a compression and this, this part here is a rarefaction. So the point axis representing a compression and the sound waves, they are longitudinal wave. The question is which type of wave is a sound wave and what is at the axis? So I think longitudinal wave and compression. So I think that uh, it is uh, a part longitudinal wave and compression at the axis. So question number 27, I think A is the right option. Question number 27, A is the right and the best option available there. So the next thing they are asking us, a man, a man stands between two tall buildings, P and Q. He is 50 meters from the P and 200 meters from the Q. So these are the two buildings. The man is standing here. The distance from the building P is 50 meters. The distance from the building Q is 200 uh, meters. So he sounds a horn. And their question is, their question is, he sounds a horn. He hears the first echo from building P. And one second later, he hears the first echo from the building Q. What is the speed of the sound calculated using this information? OK. So thus, this sound went 50, uh, covered 50 meter and then came, came back, covered a 50 meter. And so this sound wave, which came back from the P, it has totally covered a 100 meter distance. The sound wave, which went to the building Q, it went 200 meter and then came back 200 meter after reflection. So this sound has covered how much? 200 plus 200, 400 meter. So the difference of the distance between these two uh, sound waves is 400 minus 100, that will be 300 meter. And the time, the time lapse between the two echoes is one second. So the distance divided by the time, that will be 300 meter divided by one meter and one second, and that will be, and that will be the speed, 300 meter per second. So here I have shown you the solution. That is question number 28 coming up on your screen. So this sound wave which came from the P has to cover 100 meter. This sound wave has to cover 400 meter. So the difference of the distance is 400 minus 100. That's 300 meter. So the time lapse between the two echoes is one second. So the speed of the sound is distance, difference of distance divided by difference of time. So that is 300 meter divided by one second, and that will give you 300 meter per second. So the speed of the sound is 300 meter per second. So that is the B choice, uh, 300 meter per a second. So that was the question number 28, 300 meter B part. Question number 28, B is the Twenty-eight is the B. Twenty-eight B is the right option. Question number twenty-eight B is the right option. Okay. So the next question is question number twenty-nine. What is uh, what is one of the uses of the ultrasound? The ultrasounds can be used for the prenatal scanning. The ultrasounds are used to find out the depth of the seabed. The ultrasound is also used to clean the jewelry. He says cleaning the jewelry. Yes, the ultrasound is used for cleaning the jewelry. What we do, we take a washing uh, a liquid, and in that we dip the jewelry, and then we uh, produce ultrasound waves in that liquid. 
and the dust particle will dislodge from the jewelry that is and the jewelry will be clean so for cleaning the jewelry the ultrasounds are used fluorescent tubes no optical fibers no sun bed no in the sun bed we use uv light we don't use ultrasounds so question number 29a is the answer yes our answer my dear students the question number 29a is the right 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 option okay so we are on the question number 30 a positively charged rod is held near an uncharged matter sphere on an insulating stand uh what is the distribution of the charge on the sphere so the free electrons will accumulate here because they will be attracted to this positive rod. So there, here the negative will appear and here due to the deficiency of the electron, a positive will appear. The negative and the positive, they will be equal to each other. So to me, C looks the best option, sir. In question number 30, I think C is the right option. Question number 30, you can see the C is the right option. Okay, the next question. Two matter spheres are mounted on insulating stands. Sphere X is initially uncharged and sphere Y is initially positively charged. So this is positively charged. This is neutral. A matter rod, rod held from an insulating handle is placed in contact with the X and the Y as shown. So this is insulating handle from where you're holding it. And this is also a conductor. So uh, when you connect them, some of the electrons from the X will go to the Y, some of the positive of the Y will be neutral, but the Y still will be positive. And when you will remove this, uh, the X has lost electrons, so it will also become positive. So both of them at the end will be positive. So what are the charges on the X and Y after the rod is placed in contact with them? So both of them will become positive. So both of them, they are positive. That's question number 31. Okay, so that's question number 31A is the right option, sir. Question number 31. Question. Question number 31, A is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is question number 32. He says the diagram shows a simple electric uh, circuit. Which road describes the charge on an electron and the direction of the electron flow through the resistor? So this is a charge on the electron. The charge on the electron is negative and the electron flow through the resistor will be from negative terminal to the positive terminal in the circuit. So it will be from Y to X. So, so the charge is negative and the electron flow is from negative to uh, positive. So it will be from Y to X, okay? So uh, B looks the best option. Question number 32, B is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are going to the next question. He says, uh, in the next question, he says, uh, Charge of four, 0.4 Coulomb passes through a resistor in one second. In two seconds, 200 joule of thermal energy is produced in the resistor. What is the potential difference across the resistor? So I can uh, very easily find the potential difference. I can find the current here. I know the energy. Simple. Okay. So... Uh, So we know uh, I will be charged divided by time, that is 0 0.40 Coulomb divided by one second, that will be 0 0.40 ampere. The energy is 200 joule in two seconds. So how much will be the charge? I multiply T, 0 0.40 multiply two seconds, and that will be 0 0.8 Coulomb. The energy, the voltage is equal to energy divided by charge, so the energy is 20 joules in two seconds, and the charge passed from there in two seconds, 0 0.8 Coulomb. So divide 20 joules with 0 0.8 coulomb, that will be 25, uh, 25 volt. 
25 volt. A little tricky question. Question number 20, 33, 25 volt. So we think that uh, C is the right option. 33. Question number 33, C is the right option. <clears throat> Uh, question number 34, he says, the diagram shows a simple electric circuit. Which meter measures the current in the resistor R2? So the mm. current, which measures the current in the R2, so the this ammeter will measure the current flowing through the R2. Very simple, straightforward. Okay, 34, D is the choice. Question number 34, D is the right option, sir. When the flash on a camera is used, a charge of 1.5 Coulomb flows uh, for 0 0.0030 seconds through the flash lamp. The average voltage across the flash lamp is 3600 volt. What is the electric energy supply to the flash lamp and what is the average power supply? Okay, so very simple. The charge is given, the time is given, the voltage is given. I can find out the current. Okay. So here, you know, uh, I is equals to Q divided by T and the 1.5 Coulomb charge and the time is 0 0.0030 seconds. So when you divide 1.5 Coulomb with the 0 0.0030 uh, seconds, you get 500 ampere. So the current flowing there is 500 ampere. Now the energy is, you know, the formula for the energy is one uh, IVT. The formula for the energy is IVT. So that will be I is 500 ampere, the voltage is 3600, and the time is 0 0.0030 seconds. So the energy will be 5400 joules. The energy will be 5400 5, joules. The power is equal to the energy divided by time. The power will be energy divided by time. So the energy is 5400 and the time is 0 0.0030 seconds. So when you divide it on the calculator, you will get 1.8 x plus 6 watt. So the power will be 1.8 uh, raised to power 6, 1.8 x plus 6 watts. And uh, let's check, do we have this answer? Uh, yes, D. D is the right option. Let's check. 35D is the right option, sir. Okay, now he says the diagram shows an electric circuit. Okay. Which lamp lights when the switch S1 is closed and S2 is open? If you uh, keep it open and you close it, the lamp 1 and lamp 2, their path will be completed. Lamp 3 will remain off and the lamp 1 and lamp 2, they will lit. So the lamp one and two will, uh, they will lit only, okay. So I think C is the option. Question number 36, C is the right option. So let's go to the next question. In the next question, he says, the diagram shows a hair dryer. Which statement explains why the hair dryer does not need an earth wire because the, you see the, it has double insulation. Double insulation means that the, Double insulation means that it has a plastic body. So its body can, if it comes in contact with the live wire, the current cannot come in the body because the body is made of the plastic. It is called double insulation. So I think C is the right option, sir. Question number 37, C is the right option. Okay, next question is, uh, left hand can be used to determine the direction of the force when a current carrying conductor is perpendicular to a magnetic field, which quantities are represented by the direction? Okay, so this is my left hand, this is my left hand. And when I stretch my uh, the thumb, the index finger and the middle finger, mutually perpendicular to each other, you see, the thumb is the force, The uh, this index finger represents the magnetic field, and this middle finger represents the direction of the conventional current. So the P will be the force experienced by that conductor, and the Q will be the magnetic field, direction of the magnetic field, 
and R will be the direction of the uh, conventional current. So here we have the option. And he says, uh, okay, so their question is, uh, which quantities are represented by the direction of the fingers P and the Q? The P represents the force, and the Q represents the magnetic field, and the R represents the conventional current. So I think D is the best option. And I think... So uh, D looks the best option to me. And let's check. This is question number 38. D looks the best option. Yes, the D is the best option available. Okay, so that was the question. I hope you understand. Question number 38, D is the right option. Okay, so we are going to the next question. The next question is question number 39. As, as a magnet is moved into the coil of wire as shown, there is a small positive reading on the sensitive ammeter. So which charge must, in, which change must increase the size of the reading? You see, when you move the magnet relative to the coil, uh, because the magnetic flux of this magnet passing through the coil changes, uh, so uh, EMF is induced in the coil. We call it electromagnetic induction. And uh, how you can increase that current? Um, there are some methods. Uh, for example, you can increase the number of the turns per unit length of, in this coil. Or you can use a stronger magnet. Or you can, uh, you, you can move this magnet faster. Okay. So which, must, uh, which chain must increase the size of the reading? Moving the opposite pole into the coil, no. Pulling the magnet out of the coil, no. Pushing the magnet in faster, yes, that can do that job. If you move the magnet faster, uh, the EMF induced will be larger. Unwinding some of the turns of the wire, that will decrease the current. Uh, you should increase the number of turns of the wire. So question number 39, I think C is the right option. Question number 39C is the right option. Okay, now we have the last part and it says, electric power is transmitted by the cables over long distances at very high voltage. What are the effects of using a high voltage transmission system? You see in the power station when you, when you produce the electricity and you want to transmit that in through the transmission uh, high tension wires, uh, you increase the voltage by using a step up transformer. Why we do this? Uh, because when you increase the voltage, the current decreases. And when the current decreases, so the power loss in the transmission lines decreases. So by using a step-up transformer, we will increase the voltage. The current in the cables will decrease. And the power loss in the cables will also decrease. So I think D is the best option. Uh, question number 40, D looks the best option. Yes, the D is the right option. So uh, we have reached the end of this paper. This paper has 40 MCQs. And my dear students, uh, today we have done uh, May, June 2022, one, two paper. And this paper one belongs from the zone two, or you say variant two. And uh, I have tried my best to explain you the concepts uh, to the best of my ability. And if you have learned something from this video, and if you think that you have, uh, this video has helped you to understand some of the concepts of the physics and practice the past paper, please like this video, also share the link of this video onto your Facebook account, onto your Instagram, and onto your Twitter account, share the link with your teachers, with your friends, with your class fellows, with your junior students, because that will help me promote um, uh, my channel. My name is Farhan Mother. It's a blessing for me to be able to do this work. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. God bless you all.